Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really excellent. And thank you, Jane, for what actually turns out to be an excellent lead-in in in terms of our introduction or kind of setting the scene uh, for the day, I think. Really super stuff, both of you. Um, So in terms of me and my research, I'm really interested in the presence of technology and machines actually at work, so in workplaces. So um, where we've had, as I say, a very nice kind of foundation for looking at how new technologies impact how people exercise and, and, and understand themselves in terms of fitness and wellness. So this links in t- interestingly because uh, with the possibility of the new technologies, the kind of sensory uh, technologies, the kind of tracking um, and the data that can be accumulated, uh, the big questions are how the data can be used, who's going to use it, for what purposes. So that's what I'll talk about today a little bit um, uh, and coming at it from a kind of a cross-disciplinary angle, which is absolutely the case, and John mentioned that, that I've got a lot of interest in industrial relations, so the kind of uh, what happens when people work uh, and labor, and what that means um, in our new world of work, where we become more intimately associated with machines in whatever form, how we use them, how they use us, do we work for them, these questions. Okay, so those are the, the kind of things I'll address today. So there's an international political economy dimension uh, through some work, in fact, I'm doing with ILO, which I'll kind of uh, um, kind of address a little bit today, um, as well as a bit of postmodernism, poststructuralism, feminism. So go with me, okay, with this one, with Marxism too. So it it, it sounds like a broadly uh, broadly kind of based uh, project, but you'll understand as I go along how I'm dealing with that. Okay. So how am I going to deal with the kind of terms of reference that we were given for the day? Well, in fact, it fits very well uh, with st- some stuff that I'm working on. So when you, when you talk about tracking and surveillance and the understanding of the self, I think it's extremely important. We can start to query about what we mean by self in a philosophical way. Uh, but what I'll do with this one, because um, the understanding really is about how we feel that we can behave at work, uh, what we think is being done, um, in terms of an, in the new employment relationship. What, what is that relationship? What are the kind of possibilities and these kinds of questions? And what does that mean for me? So who can I be in the workplace? Uh, do I feel that I'm being um, pressured into new things? Is there any kind of stability at work anymore? So a little bit about agility, the questions of how uh, a kind of software development manifesto becomes part of something um, symbolically that we are supposed to expect change and these kinds of things. And where work, of course, now is all of life. So the fact that uh, work-life integration is endemic um, and that, in fact, we find it very hard to switch off, log out, turn, turn out, t- tune out, these kinds of things. Um, so what I'll be drawing on from today, so there are a couple of different things um, that also links with how we are governed in terms of the workplace, as it were. Um, so the book that I'll be putting the manuscript in just a couple of weeks, Quantified Self and Precarity, um, and again, looking very much at the social justice side angle that I've just mentioned in terms of expected transformation, unable to have stability uh, in work, not able to kind of organize your life, the kind of spatial temporal dimensions of that. Um, the ILO paper is listed next. Um, but today, in the final one where I really look at uh, the kind of corporeal dimensions of self-tracking and the kind of, in terms of philosophical point that we make, uh, is very much that it puts the cognitive over the corporeal and a straight jacket of Cartesianism, so that kind of stuff. But today is a bit of a new paper that I'm exploring. Um, and so I'll be dealing with some of these issues, but also what I'm doing is I'm working out the case study. I'm, I'm bringing the data from a case study for my British Academy Leverhulme project, which I'm starting the second year for now. Um, so this is a project over the course of a year, working with a company that actually introduced fitness and trackers with their employees to find out kind of what that meant for the worker and the understanding of the self and actually the way that, that, that workplaces are governed today as a result of new technologies. And I'm drawing from some of this literature. I actually just put this from the paper to give you a sense. Obviously, we have the digital labor and vo- virtual work questions that have been developed by Hughes, Fuchs, and Holtz, these kinds of uh, projects. Uh, We've got kind of symbolic impacts on society of new technologies, questions around automation. So again, it's it's along the kind of the way I see it, a continuum, that we've got forms of mechanization and automation that themselves aren't necessarily new. But we're getting to the point where, again, machine-body relations uh, become intensified in ways that I think bring new kinds of questions that we need to be asking right now at this point in history, legal questions, social questions, um, and also questions about possibilities very much at work and labor.
But again, it's not necessarily something new. Uh, the ta you know, Taylor and the Gilbreths were both very interested in this turn of the century. Um, the Gilbreths were very interested, in fact, in motion and fatigue studies, which I think gets a little bit overlooked. Of course, this is in the human relations school, something that's very much uh, dealt with, that um, the one best way could be achieved. So I think it's important to think in terms of uh, what kinds of ideals uh, the, these kind of early understandings of scientific management, as it becomes called, uh, what this means in terms of who the worker can be at work, that there will be some specific uh, way of moving that's understood as the right one, okay? And also the way that Taylor understood the first class man. So his, his query was really, why doesn't management understand what workers are doing? Okay, so he, he went into the steel industry and he, he said, you know, for some reason, uh, there's this disconnect between a worker and their manager, so we really need to understand that. And then to define what's the ideal way. And then in terms of the Gilbreths, this was in Brick Lane. So another industry, but very much a similar quest to say, why is everyone building, uh, you know, the wall in a different way from each other? Couldn't there be one specific, very best way to put the bricks together? And that was his uh, kind of intervention. Now, trade unions were very skeptical about this, these moves uh, because they said, is this not so on the way to automation? So very <coughs> early days to say, you know, uh, what, what does this mean for how we behave, how we can act? Is, the, is it a form of speed up? You know, is it going to lead to work intensification? These kinds of things. <clears throat> so again, to give you an, an idea of the social justice angle of my research, these are from some archives uh, that it's very interesting stuff that the League of Nations actually uh, did quite a good, quite an interesting stuff. Can you actually see that? Quite a good study. This is published <coughs> in 1927. Got a bit of a throat. Um, where they're interested in looking at what scientific management in Europe, what, what will this mean? Uh, you know, and actually the, the League of Nations was quite, was quite okay with it and thought this could be brilliant. You know, it's really putting science at the forefront for how work can be performed and, and this is gonna you know, help everyone be efficient and, and it can lead to all sorts of equality of economies and things like this. <coughs> um, but the American Federation of Labor and the AFL-CIO are really saying, well, you know, the business machine, what, what happens when it runs on its own power? Questions around uh, if we automate work, if we mechanize work, who's gonna buy the product? I mean, these are very sensible questions. Um, and things that we're in fact dealing with now, and I would argue at a much, in a far more intensified kind of level, but again, early days. So it isn't necessarily that monitoring and technology is uh, monitoring and tracking at work is necessarily new in terms of what's being looked for, but I think what is new is what's being measured and the conditions within which we work. Um, uh, so that's kind of what I'm interested in looking at. We have an increase in the types of technologies that are available for monitoring at work. So there's electronic performance monitoring. We've got things like reputation profiling um, that's happening with the algorithmic possibilities. So we have the algorithmic boss in platform work. Um, crowd work, you'll be very familiar with Uber. Upwork, Mechanical Turk. So these are online platforms, where client-based platforms, where you can become a kind of, uh, make this kind of a, a exchange of work very much on a platform basis with very different kind of rights for workers. Okay, so that's very important. And again, I've mentioned mechanization and automation. There's another solution, sociometric. Starts with Olivetti's research badge, so it's pictured here. Um, and the successors are called the sociometric badge and wearable sensor badge. So these can trigger automatic doors with RFID, transmit wearer identities, um, forward telephone calls. But the badge also, and this is important, tracks workers' movements, speech, <coughs> tone of voice, proximity, interactions in that way, analyzes voice patterns, uh, nonverbal cues, picks up on nonverbal cues, deduces mood, interpersonal influences. Um, uh, the, there are other contexts, call centers, so the kind of data that's generated here, there is emotion tracking, uh, the way that someone moves uh, their face is understood to represent their, of course, mood. So it's all this kind of affective and emotional labor stuff that I'm starting to look at. There are discussions around using a Google Glass in an interview context so that the interviewer can understand, you know, even the twitch of the eye, what could it mean? What, what could it mean about the essence of this human? So there are all sorts of kind of <laughs> investigations, experiments happening uh, that, that start to introduce these really more intrusive technologies. So that's what I'm kind of interested in and then so the precarity dimension uh the you can't see that it says precarity but it does digitalizing precarity for profit so this is very much part of the book i guess you can see it um 
Here is a picture of the sociometric solution, data technology, changing office culture, and these kinds of things, the kinds of how much data can be accumulated, what that could mean, how management can make decisions based on the analytics. Okay. But now you will meet Pavlock. So Pavlock will aid you in getting rid of your bad habits. This is, a, this is a wearable that will zap you if you countervene as you've programmed it uh, and if you revert into your bad habits. Um, I've tried one. It's not very comfortable. Um, <laughs> let's just say. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is leave you with this beautiful photo while I try to go through the, the way that I'm arguing these things and the kind of ways I'm trying to theorize this. It's almost a test, okay? So it's the kind of, and I really want to get some discussion around this if, it, if we have time. So what I'm trying to argue then in this particular new, uh, I hope, intervention is that the kinds of digitalized methods that I've told you about are ways of measuring and controlling affective labor, emotional labor, and that this is reaching unprecedented levels. And I'm starting to say that there's a, this is a form of a new work design model linked with agility. Um, and what this does is it accelerates the kind of importance of machines and technology. What it does is it normalizes the risks, the, the kind of expectations for transformation. It normalizes those. Um, and the symbolic kind of link with machines is, of course, if you look at agility and how it was developed in 2001, it's very much that uh, we're, we're saying that transformation and change is inevitable. We have to understand that machines, you know, technology develops quickly. Um, I link it with Kaizen and with kind of just-in-time production as well, but I see it as, as really in, re inverting that relationship between the machine and worker, uh, and, that you, and that within that context, the technologies that are measuring and penetrating all of life are sort of there in the wellness format as they are, put forward in wellness initiatives, in a way to aid uh, workers in managing effectively emotionally change. So that's a, it's an aspect of emotional and affective labor that I don't think is explored as much as I'm intending to do. Um, so what I call this is a, a process of capturing emotion and affect in conditions of the agile, as I've told you. And these are intensified attempts to capture something called unseen labor. So at once, invisible labor, as the autonomists called it. Um, unseen denotes intention. Um, so the invisible is now under scrutiny to individualize, responsibilize, and externalize costs for its use value and for intensified control over the labor process and over workers ourselves. So the use value then of the labor power that of course is part of what, you know, what makes us productive individuals um, and its reproduction are depicted as exchange value and captured as a surplus by the new measures that I've, I've uh, kind of outlined where capital tries to define value absolutely where the qualitative is subsumed, where nothing can exist outside of capitalist relations. Um, so as a central aspect then of the new working uh, monitoring technologies is to quantify qualitative aspects of work and of the labor process, such as mood, fatigue, psychological as well as physical <coughs> well-being, so as those are brought together, and of course stress. So what this does is it renders the worker permanently visible to management. Um, it renders sites of everyday resistance that, of course, should be coming about through these affective relations, um, as would be facilitated by worker-to-worker -worker communications as penetrable and controllable by capital. Okay. So, that's my theory. Um, but to kind of give you a sense of corporate wellness, now to go into a bit more of the uh, empirical, um, to capture affect. So what this table does really and what I'm doing, actually this is part of the book, is to go through the different periods of work design history to say to what extent you saw uh, ways of trying to capture and understand uh, unseen labor. Okay, so as you want to, to look at this, unseen labor capture, so I'm kind of saying that within agility, it intensifies. So you had during industrial betterment, scientific management, during these periods of time, uh, you know, signs of this um, emerging, and that now we're in a period where it's actually intensifying. So in 2015, we had nearly a fifth of employees in Europe uh, had access to wearable technology at work provided by your employer. Um, and the benefits uh, that, that was, were seen were for, of course, improved productivity, employee wellness. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much question around healthier worker, happier worker, more productive worker. Uh, John alluded to the kind of Radiohead uh, song. Uh, and then, so these are quickly jumped in more recently. Now, 2016 research shows one in three companies are providing some kind of wearable device in a wellness context. Um, so these track activity, 
are seen very much, and Jane mentioned this, save money, so it's savings, um, and of course improving the uh, health and happiness, again, productivity. This is called a quantified work environment, perfect, um, by Berson et al, 2016. So this resembles kind of a world of athletes. So you have the question of the high performance management um, uh, area. Uh, so technology aids people really in identifying their peak performance times, very similar to in the athletic context, um, gaining rapid feedback, so these kinds of things. So it it's a kind of transformation of the quantified uh, sort of scenario. Other pro so there are types of projects. We've got Global Corporate Challenge, Job Own Up. Uh, these are types of wellness initiatives with, of course, the self-tracking. They provide a dashboard for each employee uh, where you can make links. Uh, you can compare data to fitness. You can have gamified kind of corporate activities uh, and these types of things tailored for the individual as they are finding themselves uh, increasingly productive happy and healthy, and these kinds of things. Okay, so the timing's good. Um, just got a little bit of time to talk about the living labs um, in Rotterdam, which is where I ran the study that I'm you know, about to tell you about. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you a taste of the data, and not go into a lot of detail, but tell you about the project itself, quantified uh, workplace uh, project. So this is a kind of a Dutch corporate wellness program uh, set up in the Netherlands from 2015 to 16. Um, so Workers were provided with a Fitbit charge activity tracker. So all the opt-in workers alleged, well, it's an opt-in um, program. Uh, so companies data analysis, analyst, as it were, also set up the individualized dashboard for each employee. Um, so you had rescue time embedded on your computer. So what this does is it, it, it sort of tracks productivity in a way that you've, you've kind of tailored it if you want to, uh, but it's screen time, so how long you spend in certain databases or certain uh, websites, are you on social media too much, you know, you can, you can decide. Um, and the third thing is that the volunteers on the project also received a workday life log email where you gave subjective um, kind of input on your uh, stress and your well-being uh, for the day. So you had this over the entire years, so you had productivity, well-being and stress. What's quite important about this is of course that these are subjective measures. Um, the company in, in discussions for setting up the project which they ran, uh, the idea was to link uh, productivity to fitness and to say okay so we've got the data on how much people are bringing to the company because they're most of them consultants so they're actually making a revenue for the company. It was a real estate and, and interior design company. The other thing to say is that what's also important is that it was during a period of merger. So you had a smaller company being merged into a larger company. So there's that element of transformation that I talked about before, symbolically relating to the kind of agility question. And this was also part of a move toward intensified agility, according to the management who set up the project. So, so I think it's quite interesting how that, that's, that's all linked. Um, but what I'm arguing, and through the interviews, uh, what I sort of discovered, is that a range of unseen attributes were also measured and captured. So this included self-awareness, autonomy, goals, mood management, and self-management. And so what I've done is I've just said what kinds of activities and behaviors um, and dispositions are expected in a kind of transformation and agile environment. So this is just summary of the participation in data. You can kind of see who the, who the uh, participants were, but again, professionals, we have consultants, project manager, uh, you know, senior consultants, director, account manager. So you have a whole list of people who are working in a professional context who are involved in the project. Um, this is the timeline to show what data was collected when. So again, I had a range of different data sources. Uh, one was from the surveys, the second from the semi-structured interviews, which I held um, about a fourth of the way through the project, then three fourths of the way through the project with all participants. And then data collected by the company was the daily step count, average heart rate, um, daily time spent <laughs> on productive or distractive uh, computer-based activities, as I've told you, from rescue time, and then, of course, from the daily self-reports. Um, the idea, again, was to link well-being with well-billing. Okay, so, so it's a nice, yeah, uh, sort of a nice uh, setup. Okay, so here it's showing the frequency. So what I'm gonna do, is to tell you really what my findings were, I think more than anything else. Uh, although I did put a couple of the, I'll put a, in a, just a second, I'll show you a couple of the slides. Um, so again, through the interviews, and I, I set it up in a grounded theory kind of way, so it was inductive. So my research questions were very much around um, what was the impact of setting up this kind of project in the workplace on employees? How did they respond? 
how did they, you know, what did they think about this project? How did they, and, and the next one really was around, in terms of responses, what does it mean? So in terms of the, the findings, uh, it was very much that there was a high rate of resistance. This was passive, both passive and active. Most people dropped out, 70%. Uh, or is it 75%? So it's a, quite a high rate, I've got it here. 75% actually stopped using the technology by at least the Fitbit by the end of it. So you have a whole range of, of kind of dropping out. So you have the kind of active um, uh, resistance, quote unquote, and then you also have the more passive, which is seen in the interviews. Um, difficulties in using the technology. So these are from the first interviews, motivation, relationship, behavior change. The other thing that I found is that there were perceived changes to behavior and dispositions or uh, attitudes um, to the, and again, this is not done in a psychological, this is perfect, in a kind of way of psychological analysis as it were. And the reason I did it that way is because this is subjective data that, that was taken from the participants and I did it in a qualitative uh, sort of way, social science way. Um, let's see, okay, so one interesting thing to mention, which I will do now, is that uh, partway through the project, the Dutch Personal Data Protection Agency um, asked some questions about the project and said, okay, you're one of the first to do this. Let's find out who is storing the data, where is the data being stored? Um, and this is a very interesting question. Can there ever be a consensual relationship between an employer and an employee? And this is why I said before, um, opting in, uh, there are questions around this. This is one of the questions we have to ask in this kind of wellness initiative, particularly when new types of data are being captured and there are clear reasons for it that of course are, are linked with both um, benefiting the company and also benefiting the employee. And let me give you some of the kind of questions for research at this point. So we've got the encroachment intimacy and these kinds of questions. So what really do you want your employer to know about you? What does that, what does that mean about the employment relationship as it were? What, what can it mean? Does it, is it, is this a kind of autonomy that I'm achieving? What does it mean when I am supposed to be a self-manager, when I only have a list of ways that I can self-manage? These kinds of questions. Uh, technology and work design, this is an obvious one. Does quantification reflect real life? So the quantification, qualification kind of questions. Uh, opting out, while maybe on paper, and there's some research that looks at this, on paper you are told you can opt in, opt out, but are you gonna be left out? You know, the gamification kind of aspect, where people are, are you know, uh, competing against each other in groups, like how many, you know, could you climb Mount Everest, you know, with an aggregate of your steps. Work-life integration in, uh, imbalance, as I've talked about, the all-of-life questions, displacement of accountability, um, does this, you know, if it's self-management again in that sort of way, questions around the wellness syndrome, and this one I think is one of the most interesting, is that if we talk <coughs> about the the, um, the kind of data-driven technologies, uh, first of all, that are neutralizing supposedly performance management and is seen to potentially eliminate bias in judgments, um, potentially in the appraisal context, does it mean this quantification of the unseen labor that goes into the types of ch uh, change management, I, I myself become a change manager, as it were, you know, these kinds of questions, or do I, how can I say necessarily that I can compete if my physical well-being isn't already at some level? So the kind of, again, the kind of quantified workplace, does that turn into something like high-performance athletics? Is that appropriate? Uh, does it mean that existing skills, working time capacity, so does it potentially lead to discrimination for, let's say, caring individuals, um, working mothers, these kinds of questions? Access to social capital. Again, is this a level, is this a, a level playing field that we are talking about when we're quantifying uh, work in these new and, and relatively uh, invasive ways? So could it result in unequal judgments and appraisals? Does it introduce extra stress? Does it lead to work intensification? What does that mean if we're expected to constantly be in conditions of instability, agility, precarity? And the next question will have to be, are we seeing other forms of resistance? So if we talk about the kind of explicit dropout from the project, say is that resistant exit from the project, what other kinds of resistance are we seeing? Dragging feet, um, you know, use of, of your, bring your own devices, and what that means. So those are the questions today, and I think that's it. Um, obviously, I would like questions, discussion, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you.